hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And as I mentioned earlier today, we have a situation where Credit Suisse and Nomura have announced large losses. Seems like that may not be the end of that. And fortunately, Matt Carr of QCI Partners joining me on the show today for an update. Matt, I know you've been digging into it. You're familiar with what's going on and what can you share? Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Um, well, this was kind of a, a situation here where there was a very quick unwind of large concentrated positions in certain stocks that uh, people are probably familiar with, like Discovery, Viacom, some Chinese stocks. And essentially what happened, a lot of the news out of the prime brokers, the banks, is that there was a large derivative position uh, it was somewhat akin to a swap. It's called a contract for difference. And what these are is a fund can call up a bank and say, hey, I want $100 million exposure to Google stock, let's say. And instead of posting $100 million, what actually happens in these transactions is that the two parties, the bank and the fund, settle up at the end of, let's say, each month in a cash basis, how much the stock moved on a hundred million nominal. So it's it's a good way for a fund to get leverage quickly without a lot of cash out the door. And there are also benefits to the banks because the regulations are such they don't have to post a huge amount of capital. But the downside of these transactions, as we're seeing, is that there can be large leverage and seemingly large losses coming out of uh, nowhere because you're not holding large exposures on your books and all of a sudden you have to make large payments. So in this situation, um, there was a particular fund that had leveraged with a few counterparties that we already know of, uh, Nomura, Credit Suisse. I had a discussion with someone at Credit Suisse this morning um, and they had to unwind it. There were margin calls and there were defaults. So it's showing up across the system, even though it was an opaque transaction to begin with. Which makes sense. And Matt, do you have any idea of how interconnected this may be? You've mentioned there's a lot of leverage and there's two banks that are known. From what I've been hearing, it seems like the kind of thing that might be a little deeper than that, but that's why I wanted to get your opinion on it. Yeah, these... These derivatives are over the counter, so they don't trade over an exchange. There's, they're very opaque. There's no transparency. So, you know, it's not as though it's easy to gauge how much, how much exposure is actually out there. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see other counterparties come forward in the next week or so with some degree of loss, even though that's all still being quantified somehow uh seems like you would have to know what you've lost but um you know oftentimes entities can put these uh trades on with different counterparties and you know just by nature they're opaque so it's it's another reminder that there are a lot of risks latent risks in the financial system that aren't readily visible you know, you, you didn't necessarily see this on a Credit Suisse balance sheet last quarter. And it's not the only one. So it's something to keep, you know, an eye on and be cognizant of. Yeah, Matt, that's certainly what I've experienced in the 20 years I've been in finance, where it's like you could dig through these balance sheets now, and I don't think you'd be able to find it. In fact, it's funny you said that, at least the banks would know how much they lost, although amazingly that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, as I'm looking at a quote here from Credit Suisse saying, well, at this time it is premature to quantify the exact size of the loss resulting from this exit. It could be highly significant and material to our first quarter results. And Matt, when I think about how these things, and again, I, it's premature to say this is going to be of a Lehman-like nature or anything like that. I mean, I do think something like that is inevitable and you know it's 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 not a closed situation because maybe 
some other bank rushes to sell out their position and you have a raise for the exit, so you could have a $2 billion loss today that could become much larger than that. We saw that happen in the subprime unraveling. And again, we're you know dealing with very limited information here, but as you and I talked about earlier today, I mean, if they had some idea of the size of the loss, in my experience, usually they want to get that number out there, take the hit, like get the damage control going, but here there's the commentary seems to be more geared towards the we don't really know and nobody seems to be saying, hey, this is contained. I don't know if that would matter if they did say that, but it doesn't sound like this is the end of it to me. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's a really important point here. And I would highlight one of the holdings that uh, we did have experience with Discovery. Um, we had owned Discovery. We, we had bought it a little over 18 last year. And we had exited it uh, in the 45 to $48 range. Of course, then, anyone who sees a chart of it, it, it made quite a run. But last week, the volumes, just the sheer volumes that were hitting uh, the A shares, and the C shares were tremendous. Stock went from basically 80 to 33. And so what the the banks, the counterparties here are trying to manage is they're trying to manage the bleeding, as you said, because they're probably trying to make maneuvers to offset some of that or minimize it. But, for example, discovery, you know, the sizes that we're talking about are immense to the day-to-day volumes for the shares that trade. So you start to affect the underlying price with these large activities. So you want to spread it out over time. You want to minimize that. Um, so I'm not entirely shocked that they're they're giving more general statements, um, vague statements. I'm sure they're dealing with it in real time. Um, but uh, these are huge moves, and they can continue. And they certainly can continue to be volatile. Yeah, and Matt, perhaps uh, one other thing I'd like to run by you. I was reading an article where they were discussing the way that these shares were being dumped on Friday. And it sounds like people were just fire selling big block orders. uh, And that was a bit alarming to me where there's the quote of one guy was saying, Hey, I've never seen anything like this in the 25 years. Again, we're dealing with imperfect information, but I, so I sometimes I use this analogy where let's say there's a brick wall behind me and I can't see what's going on directly behind me because it's too big to look over. But if I see people running past me and they're screaming and crying and they're, they're in on in flames, you know, maybe there's a chance there's a burning building behind there. Um, and I just looking at these reactions and the way, like when people are dumping large blocks of shares, that would seem to me, is it appropriate to say that was panic selling? Well, definitely For some of it has been. Of panic selling? Yeah, I, I I think, and again, I'll I'll speak directly to the one holding that we're quite familiar with, Discovery. I mean, you look at the movement and the blocks that were hitting the tape last week; they were just truly unprecedented for that stock. And in the options market, which I know you're well versed and you have a lot of viewers that are involved in options, uh, the implied vols of Discovery puts have blown out to over 150 percent. So. This is higher than they were uh, in March of last year at the beginning of the COVID lockdown. So this this is immense. Um, So that actually looks interesting to me from a standpoint of being opportunistic and working around what isn't necessarily a fundamentally driven story here. We're, We're having a liquidation in certain names. There was tremendous leverage it's being unwound quickly, and the size that's being unwound is very large with regard to 
the average volumes or even the market caps of some of these holdings. So, yeah, there's definitely some panic. People are dialing in their risk on particular names, and they have to get flat. You know, they're seeing things like 150% implied vols on U.S. equity names is not something commonplace. So risk managers are tapping a lot of people on the shoulder. Yeah, and if it were just the finance, be one thing. But then you look at the things that are happening in the world. We've had a ship stuck in the Suez Canal, a lot of military tension, de-dollarization talk. Um, and again, I, I hope it comes across. I really try to be careful not say panic selling or fire selling or, or, or things like that when it's not warranted. I think there's some times where, hey, uh, you know, you don't know when the alarm bell is going to go off, but there's conditions indicating that it could go off. So hopefully I'm freezing things in an appropriate manner. I'm, I'm doing the best I can to be accurate. I don't have full information, as I mentioned. But anyway, Matt, that's why I appreciate you joining me. And perhaps before we let you run, I'd love to get any updated thoughts. Uh, you've been following Silver for quite a while, and we've had some interesting developments Price still getting spoofed around pretty solidly today. Anything you'd like to share about what you're seeing in the silver market right now? Well, I, I think in a general sense, uh, the inflation narrative is something we all should be keeping an eye on. And, of course, uh, silver would benefit from a pickup there. Um, we had the COVID stimulus. We're talking about a multi-trillion dollar uh, infrastructure bill, and they're already discussing another COVID stimulus spending package, all of these in the trillion dollar area. So, you know, we're, we're not going to tax that money in the next year. It's plain and simple. It's going to have to be printed. So how much of that diffuses to assets that react to inflationary pressures? Uh, that's important. And then also bank lending, commercial bank lending. You know, do we see as things open up um, a pickup in bank lending, really getting M2 going? Those are things that, you know, we're watching. You haven't really seen bank lending pick up, but we do have these grandiose, very large, unprecedented spending packages coming through. Uh, these are just amazing in size when you measure these to GDP, it's just we've never undertaken programs like this. So I think that's pretty constructive for people that are looking to uh, express inflationary concerns through the metals. And it's something that continue, I think, will we'll unwind here. And Matt, would you say it's less likely that lending is going to be picking up anytime soon? if we see escalations of this whole situation with the banks and this hedge fund? I mean, it doesn't seem like it's going the right direction. Is that fair to say? Well, yeah, this is definitely another hiccup, and it shows that there, um, even with all of the uh, regulation that we've ladled on post-GFC, there are still certain areas of essentially phantom leverage. That's what we have here. We have a derivative contract that is really hard to gauge. It's hard to even know it existed. And yet it's embedded leverage in the system. So, you know, the trading desks, the prime brokers, um, it's a profitable business line until it's not. But the commercial banks, with regard to lending, I think with regard to just opening up the economy and seeing standards there lighten up can be positive for general bank lending, but like the Wells Fargo's and the community banks and um, the mid-sized banks. Just seeing some loan growth there would be very constructive. The prime brokers are kind of their own animal that have these other business lines. Yeah, well, I don't know if it makes you feel any better to know that the IMF is considering issuing $650 billion worth of SDRs. Maybe that's the true plan to, to get lending started. 
Um, and as I'll be doing a video about perhaps later today, it was interesting. I was reading that Jerome Smith, silver in the 80s book, silver profit in the 80s, he mentioned the SDRs back then, and it was interesting the way he phrased it. He said, because these central bankers, they're still going after gold and holding gold. So essentially, the SDR, he called a promise for gold, which I had never thought of it like that before, although I thought was rather interesting. And um, I think we're headed towards seeing that play out more overtly, but whether uh, that happens in the near future takes a little while. I'm sure grateful to have friends like you to discuss these things with, and thank you again for joining me, Matt. And actually, before we wrap up, can you let folks know how they can find you and what services you offer there if they would like to follow up? Yeah, sure. We manage investment portfolios for individuals and institutions. You can find us at qcipartners.com. Contact us at info at qcipartners.com. And thanks for having me, Chris. Well, thank you, Matt. Great to hear from you, as always. I know people always appreciate that. And we will look forward to checking back in again soon.